Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. And be sure to add Booze and Spirits podcast in the How Did You Hear About Podgo section of the application. It's time for an ad! Hi folks, I'm Tyler Armentrout. I'm Christopher Whedon. I'm Zach Mech. And I'm Jerry Nash. And, and we're, we're the History, History Boys. Boys. And we're kicking your door down with a Bluetooth speaker and an 18-pack of beer. Ready to start a party. It's my favorite history podcast on all the internet, not just because I'm on it, but because I listen to every episode full blast in my house drives my wife up the wall. This is the History Podcast for all you cool kids that sat in the back of the classroom. That's right. We are a comedy history podcast or a history comedy podcast. Podcast, any which way you look at it. We are the History Boys. That is spelled B O I Z for those counting. And we are found anywhere you find your podcasts. Love you. Bye. Take a bite of my burger that I got half left in there. That's a good half a burger. So it must not be from Burger King? It was. Now I want Burger King. The local Burger King. Got itself in a position where I had to close at 5 p.m. every night for a couple of weeks. How'd it do that? Well, apparently somebody from the swing shift over at Nature's Path came over and got dinner or lunch and told everyone, hey, I don't know why you guys are working here. You could come work over at our place. And we got blah, 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 blah. So the entire shift quit. Hmm. I mean, I feel like that is the corporation's fault for not taking care of their employees. There is that, but there's also the fact that a lot of the people working that shift are young and didn't think to ask, huh, how come you have enough openings that you can take a whole shift worth of people over at Nature's Path? (laughs) When I lived in Blaine, I remember when the used came through town and they went through that Burger King in their tour bus and Bert McCracken just crawled in through the drive-thru window because the restaurant was closed and he's... Did a lot of drugs. <laughs> I'm gonna be out of tea here. You sound like a Foley artist who's just quit. Just crashing and bashing and sloshing and banging. <laughs> it's my diabetes. <laughs> Nailed it. Oh, all right. Hey, everybody! It's the Booze and Spirit Podcast. It's like a drink with death. Woohoo! Welcome to the show. I'm Nick McDonald. I'm Kate McDonald, and my mouth is full because I thought we were taking a a brief pause before he started because he saw me put the pretzel in my mouth, but here we are. No, I had another tab open. I didn't know what the hell you were doing. Yeah, fair enough. Crunching pretzels because of my diabetes. You know me, dog, just crunching pretzels. It's like chilling like a villain. Crunching like a munchkin? Munchkin? Bunch, no, wait. Crunching Crunching like a munchkin. Crunching like a... We're off to see the wizard. Like the Kremlin? Is that crunchy? I guess in the winter. Crunching like a Christian? Transubstantiational wafer? I got nothing. I got nothing. nothing. Yeah, we we milked that joke as hard as we could, and all we got was hummus, so. As you hear my drink sloshing around, because it's that time. Chug, chug, chug. That tasted like burning. Could have been worse. Could have tasted like Bernie. Which one? Take your weekend? pick. Wh- which Bernie do you want to taste? <laughs> I feel like Bernie Sanders would taste better than Weekend at Bernie's because Bernie has been dead for, what, 30, 40 years at this point? Which one are you talking about now? Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not Bernie Sanders that's been dead for 30 or 40 years. <laughs> he's, he's mostly dead, which means he's partially alive. <laughs> that's right. You know, he said to blathe, which means he's asking you again for support. <laughs> I support any man that wants to... Erase any part of my student loans. Where are the hackers for that? Where are the goddamn hackers? I don't know. I don't know. Do something useful. Just saying. Give me an 800 credit score. Delete my student loans. 
<laughs> I think maybe that's not quite so easy as locking out a pipeline. Okay. There, there's, a, there's a paper trail. This is a bureaucracy we're dealing with. I guess. So, we were going to talk about the Revolutionary War was the plan on this episode. Dun, dun, dun. And you've, I presume, got a Revolutionary War drink lined up like, I don't know, grog, turpentine, engine cleaner. I do have some, some moonshine in my dash now that we don't know how potent it is. Is this the stuff you can only drink like a cap full of? Or can you drink the jar? Like, I don't know where we're at with this yet, so. All right, fair enough. Uh, let's see here. So, are we going to jump right into it? I know you had some problems because you thought you had a Revolutionary War story. Well, here's the thing. First <laughs> off, I found this thing I didn't know about. The English, the British, bring prison ships and park them along the coastlines. More people died on the prison ships than they did in combat. <laughs> so I thought this was going to be this great story because not only did all these people die on the prison ships, they just tossed them overboard or buried them like in the sand. So then people just kept finding bodies or pieces <laughs> of bodies. And I <laughs> thought this would be a great story. And all I could find was like somebody accidentally unearthed the SS Jersey or something like that. And after that, people hear phantom voices by the waterfront. That was all they gave me. Like most of our best intentioned ideas, we thought, hey, Revolutionary War had a lot of great battles, and there's lots of ghosts on the East Coast, so we ought to find a really great ghost connected to the Revolutionary War. And No, because you look up, oh, here's a famous battle site. Oh, they have a ghost. What's the ghost do? Oh, the ghost appears in somebody's living room once in a while. That's that's as far as it goes. There are There's very few, or at least we had trouble finding good ghost stories that come out of that era. That were at least, you know, entertaining. We tried. We tried, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And then I found this good story, and then I realized at the last minute it was the Civil War that they were talking about. So <laughs> that's on me. That is on me. <laughs> so what did you end up with? Did you? Oh, you wanted me to tell my story. I mean, I can tell my story. Hold on. We'll pretend I know my story. Okay. Everyone, suspension of disbelief. We're going to talk about... Jockey Hollow. That's, <laughs> that's when you can't sleep. You do Jackie Hollow and then comes on Sleepy Hollow afterwards. <laughs> it's a masturbation that you're not picking up on. I, I, I got it. No. I just... Prefer not to encourage me? Just didn't laugh. <laughs> Fine. All right. So, Jockey Hollow. Not Jock Itch Hollow. I don't know if there's really <laughs> jockeys here. Maybe it's like there's a bunch of little like woodland spirits that come out and they're like little, so they become jockeys. I don't know. Ride the centaurs in the big polo match? I'm half centaur, okay? <laughs> Sorry, did we do Finn? So, Jockey Hollow is where the Continental Army's winter camp was, and that would go down as America's worst winter ever. There was like just it's so much suffering at this fucking camp that it made everything at Valley Forge just kind of look like a peaceful beach vacation. <laughs> For the first and only time in recorded history that year, saltwater harbors and inlets along the northeastern coast froze solid. The Hudson River became a giant block of ice, so people would just cross the river on their horses with their wagons from Jersey City to New York. <laughs> it was it was real cold. The ice in the Passaic and Raritan rivers. Sorry, guys, I'm not from the. I'm not from New England. If I'm saying those wrong, because I probably am. Uh, anyway, the ice there was six feet thick. It was so cold that one soldier wrote that the ink now freezes in my pen. Is that a metaphor, a euphemism for his jockey hollow? Yeah, frozen ink in his jockey hollow. <laughs> exactly. During that entire month, the temperatures rose above freezing only once, and the 10,000 troops were pounded by one of the most vicious blizzards anyone ever remembered with two feet of snow already on the ground. So, this is starting out fun. Starting out really fun. <laughs> there was also 28 separate snowstorms that winter, with drifts as high as 15 feet being the, the norm. And it's uh, thought to be the coldest winter in North America outside of the actual fucking Ice Age. So these poor, literally poor soldiers are like in this Arctic hell, 
in little huts. They don't have any money. There's very little food. This is where people start eating their own shoes. Then yeah. Now they're barefoot <laughs> in 15 feet of snow. They start eating the horse's food. They're eating like a bark they can find. One of the officers killed his dog out of desperation and ate that. Obviously, after not too long, the soldiers begin dying from starvation, exposure, and then to add insult to injury, a smallpox epidemic rips through the camp. It's where that manifest destiny is kind of the double-edged sword right there. (laughs) So hundreds of soldiers deserted. Like, they're just like, fuck this noise. (laughs) We we wanted to fight this war, but um, I'm going to lose my feet soon. Well, well, we'll have a war in the spring. It'll be fine. <laughs> so they, well, spring starts to roll around, they, they think. And then what I like to refer to is, I know they do it here. I don't know if they call it this other places. Dogwood winter shows up, which is after the dogwoods bloom, you still get hit with a big winter storm. So 10 inches of snow fell on April Fool's Day and continued to fall as late as May. So George Washington was there. At this point in time, he's thick of everybody's shit. <laughs> So he is getting prepared to execute eight soldiers for insubordination. He decides at the last minute to reprieve seven of them, ends up hanging one of them essentially as a warning to the rest of the troops. George Washington famously was not into corporal punishment, but he thought there was going to be a mutiny if he didn't do something to, like, scare the shit out of them. Biting him with a wooden teeth just wasn't enough anymore. Those were probably slaves' teeth, but we won't get into that. Yeah, a slave named Wooden. That was... Oh, Okay. Did everyone not know that? Oh, all right. Makes, <laughs> it all makes sense now. <laughs> so uh, Jockey Hollow is now part of the Morristown National Historic Park, which is America's first national historic park. Mm. I wouldn't say there's any like specifically like terrifying haunting here, but a lot of people see interesting things. Bunch of toeless ghosts walking around. Pretty much. One of the common sites is a group of colonial soldiers marching through the dense trees. So there are a lot of war reenactors in that region. Mm -hmm. And one night there was a group of eight revolutionary war reenactors who had permission to stay overnight in one of the replica soldier huts. So one of the guys like walks to a porta potty that was down the hill from the huts. On the way back, he suddenly hears fife and drum music right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a her right next to her. Just phantom marching music. And then it's gone. (laughs) Other reenactors have seen shadowy outlines of people darting around Soldier Hut that are clearly not human. Well, living humans. The huts aren't human or the uh, shadows? Both. They did not use human flesh in the making of the huts, okay. according to my research. They do think that the ghosts are more apt to show up around the reenactors, just because they're more comfortable. I don't know. Well, I mean, a lot of times in paranormal investigators will use like a trigger object or music from the time period of the ghosts they're trying to summon force so that'd make a lot of sense yeah there is also a cemetery at the base of the hill that's essentially a hundred plus soldiers are there in unmarked graves there's just a general plaque so it doesn't appear anything specifically creepy happens there but it's just you know creepy vibes yeah, there was another story I was reading before I found the one I settled on where they were talking about fighting during this same uh, stretch of winter about what they did with the British soldiers or what they did with the revolutionary soldiers. And then like the, the German mercenaries the Brits had hired, they just kind of buried them like wherever they dropped, like they didn't even bother moving Yeah, them. it was really, have you ever dug through frozen tundra? It can't be easy. <laughs> so the hill where the huts are now is called Sugarloaf Hill. It has the nickname Haunted Hill from over the years, just because there's so many sightings that happen there. And the uh, great Sugarloaf King with the Revolutionary's Delight. Yeah. That. Hip hop, hippie to the hippie. Don't stop a shooting to the, I don't know, till the muzzle is loaded with the, I I got nothing. It was a lot harder to rap back then because it was like a good 10 minutes between each gunshot. Yeah. Gangster rap from the Revolutionary War is. (laughs) No, that's. Is that what Hamilton's about? That might be. I, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe I'll watch that. We started watching it, and I won't say I was enjoying it because I was I wasn't. But Kel was like so upset that I had to turn it off just because I I wasn't going to be able to handle two and a half more hours of her complaining about that's it. Fair. That's, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> Kel's not really into new stuff, though. No change. Change is not her friend. For someone who's an actor and. You know, your chief job as an actor is to put yourself into the mindset and embodiment of another person. She's got a real hard time seeing how people could like things she doesn't like. I'm not going to go into psychoanalysis here. (laughs) 
<laughs> but you wanna you wanna analyze that psycho. <laughs> I've done analyze that psycho. I'm just gonna keep it to myself. <laughs> I analyze all the psychos, including myself. <laughs> all these years, I thought I had these personality traits. Turns out they're just trauma responses. It's fine. <laughs> I just thought but I was a what, really what is a what is a personality trait if not a trauma response I, person? I thing? thought I just had a wicked sense of humor. And I could always lighten the mood, and that I'm a really hard worker. Yeah, no. I'm just, just super independent. <laughs> no, trauma response. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, the most well known ghost at the park is a translucent apparition of a woman dressed in long colonial style dress carrying a lantern. And she appears more frequently during the winter months of the park. There's also a house on the edge of the property. This, I don't know if it's related. I feel like this is probably not. Well, I guess it could be the dog that got eaten. Um, there's a brown dog that chases this guy's cats around the house and then vanishes. He doesn't own the dog. Hmm. And then there's, a, you know, a lot of thumps and bumps going on. Bump it with a thump it. Bump it with a thump it. Gotta have a gimmick. So, you know, there's not, you know, anything particularly terrifying going on there. But there are a lot of ghosts at the right. Sugar Loaf Gang hill which is uh <laughs> morristown new jersey if anyone needs to visit there morris day in the motherfucking time exactly all right should i lay into mine now is your jockey hollow oh my god i've got well i found a ghost at fort ticonderoga because ticonderoga is a fun word to say and everybody loves pencils mm. so that's that's the ghost i picked but then i started looking into they do the make the hist- best pencils yeah. They really do. They really do. Then I started looking into the history of Fort Ticonderoga and what happened to it during the Revolutionary War. And I'm going to have to sidetrack it so we can go over that entire history before we get to the ghost. It's not related to the ghost, but it's the most amazing goddamn story I've ever seen. Like, it is. It's like Happy Madison produced the Revolutionary War. Like, <laughs> Okay. I thought you meant that this was like an actual Happy Madison production you found, but no, I get no, it No, no. It should be. I, I need to write a script either for the stage or for a movie of this because it's an amazing fucking story. Okay. All right. So, in 1775, Fort Ticonderoga was a seemingly unimportant location strategically. In the 1750s, it was a key point for the French in the French and Indian War, but the British captured it in 1759, and when the French ceded their North American lands in the 1763 Treaty of Paris, it just became a border fort without a border. It was comfortably... Comfortably... (laughs) Comfortably surrounded by British land on all sides. So by 1775, the fort was largely falling apart, manned only by two British officers and 46 soldiers, many of whom were described as being invalid, having reduced duties because of injury or illness. The uh, fort was in large disrepair, mostly because when the French abandoned it, they made sure to blow up as much of it as they could. So they just had the skeleton crew working there with about 25 women and children. Fort Ticonderoga sits on the shores of Lake Champlain. Champlain? There. They have uh, a, there's a, there's a champion. Champy's there. He is. Is yeah. that what you're going to say? Or? Yeah. Did I? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, I, was, I was sea creature and it. it's fine. I love me a cryptid. <laughs> and Ticonderoga had earned the reputation as the gateway to the continent and was even called the Gibraltar of America at one point. Despite this, in 1775, due to its disrepair, it had more resembled a backwood village than a military fort. While it was just a little more than a rest stop to the Brits, to the revolutionaries, it was a source of a lot of worry. Ticonderoga would be strategically a major soldier travel route, allowing British soldiers from the northern provinces to quickly reinforce soldiers in the 13 colonies. It also gave the Brits a spot to approach Boston from behind, which would have split the city's defenses. And us. Never mind. (laughs) I beg your pardon. You're the one that said it was going to approach Boston from behind. Hooked on a feeling, I guess. Uh, thirdly, it was also home to a lot of heavy artillery. Cannons, howitzers, and mortars, which were all armaments that the revolutionaries desperately needed. British General Thomas Gage actually saw this potential strategic importance in the fort that it might hold for the revolutionary, so he wrote a letter to Quebec's governor about repairing and strengthening the fort, but by the time the letter arrived, it was too late. Ticonderoga was captured by the revolutionaries. 
The capture itself was orchestrated by two notable figures from American history, philosopher and politician Ethan Allen and future infamous traitor Benedict Arnold. I'm really happy you're mentioning Ethan Allen because because it actually has something to do with something later on. Go ahead. All right. (laughs) Arnold brought up the subject of taking Ticonderoga as it was on his regular travel route and he was familiar with the structure and the soldiers. So the revolutionaries began sending word and money out around the area to gather men for an assault. Arnold was... Now, at this point in things, you have to realize that there's a very severe dichotomy difference between Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen. (laughs) Like, this is your David Spade, Chris Farley, or or, or I think what works better in my head is if you assign, like, a Jason Bateman role to Benedict Arnold and a uh, Will Arnett role to Ethan Allen. Like, that's kind of how this is going to play out from this point forward, (laughs) okay? Benedict Arnold was given 100 pounds, some gunpowder and ammunition, and told to recruit 400 men for his secret mission to take Fort Ticonderoga and send back anything useful he found to Boston. While he was doing this, he learned that Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys were already on board with the plan, which caused Arnold to abandon his own plans and ride north hurriedly to catch up with Allen so fast that Arnold destroyed his horse in the process. (laughs) So, today... We attach Ethan Allen's name to, like, fancy furniture, right? But both before and after the Revolutionary War, he was basically just the good old boy of the North. He wanted mm-hmm. to keep colonies small and beholden to themselves, particularly his own area, which uh, was the New Hampshire Grants, which would later become Vermont. Yeah. And he got his hackles up over the notion of some larger governing body trying to push its agenda on these colonies, rather it be the Brits pre-independence or even the New York State after the war. He wanted nothing to do with it. He was independent for our colonies through and through. Quickly rose to the leadership of the Green Mountain Boys, which were a militia of like-minded men from the Grants, who were known for doing damn well what they pleased and answering to nobody else. I can get behind that. (laughs) So... Arnold, by the time he caught up to Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, Allen had already been elected colonel of the operation by the 100 Green Mountain Boys and about 60 men from a couple other militias that had shown up. Not only that, but Allen had already started his own plan for taking the fort and had sent Mint out to collect boats so that they could launch a lake-borne assault on Fort Ticonderoga. When Arnold arrived, insisting the Revolutionary Council had made this his operation to run, he was chided by the Green Mountain Boys, who refused to follow anyone other than Allen. Arnold and Allen worked out a deal between them, which Arnold later claimed was joint military command, but most historians think it was more likely just Arnold was given permission to march next to Allen. (laughs) The plan was to assemble at Hands Cove at 11.30 p.m., board the men onto boats, and cross the lake to take the fort by surprise. Allen's men collecting the boats didn't arrive until 1.30 a.m., and they only had enough boats for about half of the men that had gathered there. So, Arnold and Allen crossed the lake with 83 Green Mountain Boys and then dispatched the boats back across the lake to pick up the rest. Okay. As they were waiting, though, dawn was approaching, and Arnold and Allen began to worry about losing the element of surprise, so they decided to attack with the forces they had at hand. As the men approached the fort under the cover of fading night, one of the Green Mountain Boys' muskets misfired, (laughs) which caused the one lone British sentry at the southern gate to just run away as Americans began pouring into the fort. (laughs) Run away! Run away! (laughs) Not receiving any kind of fight back, the Patriots began waking up British soldiers so they could locate their weapons and confiscate them. Allen and some men charged up to the officers' quarters and captured Lieutenant Jocelyn Feltham, ordering him to wake up the captain. Feltham tried to stall for time, asking under whose authority they acted, to which Allen famously replied, In the name of the Great Jehovah and the Continental Congress! Eventually, the officer in charge of the fort, William Delaplace, emerged from his chambers. Breaches in hand, Allen would later claim, though no one backed him up on that claim, and Delaplace surrendered. No one was killed in the assault. One American soldier got poked by a bayonet, but it was nothing serious. Just a little poke in the bottom. As word spread through the Green Mountain boys, uh, as many as 400 men eventually descended on the fort to plunder it for liquor and other provisions. 
Benedict Arnold tried to control the rampant looting, but the Green Mountain Boys refused to acknowledge his authority, so Arnold just retired to the captain's quarter to await his own men that he had recruited to arrive and write up a report to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. He uh, noted that Allen and his men were, quote, governing by whim and caprice, end quote, and that he doubted there would be much left to send to Boston when they were done. <laughs> At one point in the looting, British Captain De La Place complained about the revolutionaries l- looting liquor from his own personal stores. To placate him, Allen wrote up a receipt for what the men had looted from the personal stores and gave it to De La Place, who later submitted the receipt to Connecticut for reimbursement. As you do. After the taking of Ticonderoga, Arnold was eager to put some distance between himself and Allen. One of Allen's lieutenants dispatched a team of 50 men to take nearby Fort Crown Point over from its nine occupants. (laughs) And later, Fort George was taken from its two British soldiers. (laughs) The British really, really had their bases covered in this, this. Yeah. Yeah. Arnold's men finally arrived, having captured a schooner and several bateaux. It's not a schooner. It's a sailboat. <laughs> and Bateau, they're kind of like a, the shallow bottom boat, like he's, like the Washington Crossing, the Delaware, that type of boat. Mm-hmm. So they, they captured a bunch of those boats. Arnold armed up the schooner and sailed to Fort St. John, hoping that they could raid them before they got word of Ticonderoga's fall. Allen, not wanting to be outdone, loaded up several of his men into the Bateau and started rowing after him. <laughs> <laughs> At Fort St. Jean, Arnold and his men found a British sloop of war docked, the HMS Royal George. So they waited until nightfall and snuck into the fort. They captured the sloop, which Arnold renamed the Enterprise. But I believe that might have been America's first USS Enterprise. Anyway, Arnold captured the Royal George, renamed it Enterprise, and they captured several other boats that were in the docks. Some of the captives told them that there were a company of soldiers expected to arrive any day now, so Arnold's men gathered up all the arms and supplies they could, sunk the boats they couldn't take with them, and set sail back towards Crown Point. On the return trip, they ran into Allen and his men, still rowing, (laughs) now 100 miles away from Ticonderoga, and nearly starved to death from not bringing enough provisions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> really killing the game here people <laughs> the, the two groups had a celebratory meeting and arnold kitted allen's men's up with provisions and uh continued back south to uh crown point allen's decided that his men would continue north because he believed that he could seize and hold fort saint john <laughs> Allen and his men arrive at Fort St. John on May 19th, where a traveling merchant confirmed to them that, yes, large numbers of British troops were on the way. So Allen left St. John on May 21st, just as the troops were arriving. It was nice to see you all. I have to bid a doom. It had left in such a haste that three of his men got left behind. And they're just like, like this isn't where I parked my horse. Eventually, Allen and his men abandoned Ticonderoga, particularly as the booze began to run out. Arnold commanded primarily from Crown Point, where he set his men on the work of repairing Ticonderoga, extracting the armaments, and shipping them out. After about a month, General Benjamin Hinman arrived with 1,000 men and another clash of command took over. Hinman claimed he was to take command of Ticonderoga and Crown Point, while all communications to Arnold were that Hinman was to man Ticonderoga exclusively. Eventually, the upper leadership had to confirm to Arnold that he was to serve under Hinman. Arnold thought it over a couple days, then resigned his commission and returned home after having spent more than a thousand pounds of his own money to capture the forts. And that's kind of the uh, story of (laughs) Arnold and Allen, which has a fuck ton of potential to it, if you ask me. It could be their own sitcom. It really could. It's a very odd couple. (laughs) Today, there's many ghosts reported being seen in Fort Ticonderoga, and the fort itself opens one night a year for ghost hunting. I did see that there was a Ghost Hunters episode. I didn't go tracking that down. Apparently, they didn't find much. There are reports of several soldiers in Revolutionary-era garb spotted in the upper windows of the barracks. Several red orbs have been reported throughout the building. People see the ghost of Sarah Pell, whose family began restoring the fort in the 20th century. They've seen her looking out over the garden from a window overlooking the pavilion. Fort Ticonderoga's most interesting story is that of Nancy Coates. 
It said that in 1771, the fort was under the commission of Mad Anthony Wayne, who was known as quite the philanderer. That's the same as a philanthropist, right? A full-on rapist, yeah. Yeah. He has his eyes set on Penelope Haynes, the daughter of a wealthy Vermont landowner. A beautiful girl, but one who's looking for wedlock, not just to roll in the hay. Nancy Coates, on the other hand, is a local widow who is well-known and liked among the soldiers, and known for helping them relax their lustful tension. We call that... I don't know. Never mind. There was something there. <laughs> My brain completely lost it. If you can't be with the one you love, love the uh, one you're with, is that... Sex positivity. I'm just going to talk about oh, sex okay. positivity. All right. All right. So... That works too. So while Lane, so while Wayne lusted for t- <laughs> the rum's kicking in. So while Wayne lusted for Penelope, he seemed satisfied enough to let Nancy churn his butter for him. A wink, wink. Nancy though began to fall hard for Wayne, though he never returned any of her discussions of future marriage. One day, Nancy caught Wayne riding in a carriage with Penelope. So entranced by her porcelain skin and dark locks, he didn't even notice the hand on his boot when Nancy reached out for him. Heartbroken, Nancy wandered into Lake Champlain and let the water take her. Since then, many have seen Nancy Coates' ghost on the shore of the lake, either running its foot trails or sometime even walking on the surface of the lake itself. She's been spotted standing by the fort's gate, awaiting Wayne's return, in the guard's room, or even walking among where some cottages once were. One man reported hearing a soft crying from among the reeds in the lake, and upon investigation found the body of a woman floating in the water. When he reached out to grab her, the body disappeared and the crying stopped. Now, it is of note here, there's a lot of problems with the uh, Nancy Coates story. (laughs) For starters, it says that the story is from 1771, and every version of the story I found said 1771. But we've already established that Fort Ticonderoga wasn't in American hands until 1775. (laughs) And Matt Anthony Wayne was a general for the Americans. And as near as I could tell, he didn't even join the army until 1775. Maybe he was a British officer before then, but I couldn't find anything that said he was or wasn't. Okay. Also, a lot of the... kind of gave a cleaned up version of the story because a lot of the story had other parts to it that just did not fit with the timeline that we've already established for Ticonderoga being taken in 1775, like Washington giving all these orders directly to Matt Anthony Wayne, mostly about taking care of the lands in Vermont, which we've also established from the Green Mountain Boys that Vermont wasn't identified as a territory until much later because before then it was the New Hampshire Grants. So. Well, I don't necessarily doubt the story, the storytelling, I feel like, is a little sloppy, but that's just my judgmental attitude. Well, I gave you a drink. I gave you the synopsis for my Netflix movie. You you gave me a drink? No, a ghost. There we go. I've been drinking. I had the drink. <laughs> and then the, then the words. And then the words were wrong. The words. <laughs> the words. They did the thing. It wasn't right. <laughs> Words are playing a fucking shell game on me. Leave me alone. So uh, you'd like a drink. You'd like me to tell you about a drink. Have a drink on me. Yeah. Okay. Going to be honest. I am not creating this drink. Is this an Ethan Allen drink? It is an Ethan Allen drink. (laughs) So this drink is often associated with patriot scholar and soldier and politician, Ethan Allen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like you told me the things I was going to say about Ethan Allen's life, so... (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, we won't go over that again. But, you know, before Alan decided to do all of these weird things, well, actually, it was in the midst of him doing all these things, he determined they should probably, you know, have a night of heavy drinking. Really, really seal <laughs> it, seal the deal. It kind of sounds like him at this point, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> and their, uh, their drink of choice is called the Stone Fence. Hmm. Because too many of them, and you'll just stare blankly ahead, sitting heavily like a stone fence. <laughs> so this drink is... It can be made with whiskey or cognac, but traditionally it is a rum beverage. Rum. Rum. Not a rum ham. It's rum beverage. Drinking your alcohol, you're a goddamn genius. It's, uh, it's dark rum, bitters, and apple cider. I'm going to use hard cider because I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you put that over over some, some ice, give it a little mint garnish, done. Done and done. Uh, all right. Fairly simple. Fairly uh, in the wheelhouse of a soldier on the... Uh, 
front in the Revolutionary Era? I feel like, yeah, you want to drink the rum before you go to war. That's go juice. Go, go juice. Go, go juice. I think that's Red Bull for toddlers, but... I'm going to go get shot with a bullet that travels slower than a car. I'm going to be rummed up before I get hit. Then you can just be like, ow, why are you doing that? Who throws a shoe? Me. Me. <laughs> you do. I've seen it. I don't have the same accuracy I did as a, in my youth, though. <laughs> Nor do I have the speed to rip it off my foot to throw it. I was going to say the, the spry agility to yank it off your foot in a timely fashion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just like a feisty abuela that smacks you with my slipper. Because <laughs> this is, I'm old now. It's fine. I don't think I sent you that video or something about how only white kids are the ones who can get away with calling their parents by their first name. It was some uh, Filipino gal or something decided to call her mom by her first name. <laughs> she instantly got beaten with a slipper? Not instantly. It took a moment for her mom to realize what exactly was happening. But yeah, once her mom caught full wind of what was going on, <laughs> her shoes were flying. <laughs> Fair. Fair enough. We've never called dad by his first name. We call him Stefan. I haven't even called him that. <laughs> They were called my parents by their first name, but we also had an awful lot of nicknames for our parents. So. I mean, we call our mom Spanky, so... Yeah, exactly. Might be worse. Might be a little more informal than that. <laughs> yeah, she'd probably... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we've done our duty. It seems like it went awful quick. We've told some stories. We did a drink. Doody, doody, do. Doody, 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 do. I guess we should uh, figure out what we're doing for the next episode. I mean, I was going to suggest something like prisons, haunted prisons, Oh, because I know there's material for those. Yeah, those are pretty common. World Chocolate Day, National Chocolate with Almonds Day is the day after World Chocolate Day. Now I want chocolate. Because the almond farmers wanted in on that deal. Now I want chocolate. National Sugar Cookie Day, National Pina Colada Day, Cheer Up the Lonely Day, Day of the Flemish Community. Free Slurpee Day, Mojito Day. Are Free Slurpee Day and Mojito Day the same day? They are the same day, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we missed National Moonshine Day and National Gin Day and National Bourbon Day and National Martini. No, National Martini Day is tomorrow. Mac and Cheese Day, National Nude Day. Mac and cheese. How are National Nude Day and National Tape Measure Day the same day? Isn't that just... That's just asking for trouble. Yeah. At least it's not in winter. Michelada Day. We can do Mexican ghosts. And a michelada. I could drink a michelada. No, I can't because I'm allergic to you. <laughs> I like to pretend. Why is Selena Gomez's birthday on this list? <laughs> She's very important. National Gorgeous Grandma Day. It's our Gorgeous George Day. I don't or a so hot grandma day. day. Hot grandma day. Hot grandma summer. Hot grandma summer. Orange Men's Day. We already did an Irish episode. Dude, it hasn't doesn't have to be day themed. No, but that's what I've got open on my browser is the holidays. When was the last time you picked one? You pick one. I was gonna suggest haunted prisons. Okay, haunted prisons. Or we could do like ladies in white. I don't know, ladies in red. We did ladies in red. Did we do ladies in red? Or, yeah, I guess we did. <laughs> remember, you thought I was trying to fuck a ghost. <laughs> well, I knew we did a lady in red. I couldn't remember if it was a that was the theme. And we did a lady in white, but it was not a lady in white episode. Yeah. And we did a naked lady episode. I mean. Well, not an episode, but a naked story. lady story. Haunted lighthouses. Haunted preschools. So many of those? Haunted schools are a thing. Haunted schools are a thing. I mean, school just got out for summer. Do you want to do haunted school? Schools yeah. out. Yeah, I set you up for that. I hope you're happy. Well, not now. <laughs> now you've taken the joy out of it. <laughs> what I'm here for. Haunted schools. Haunted prisons. Haunted, haunted school prisons. Bathrooms. Haunt. Moaning Myrtle. I think haunted school. I mean, there's so many haunted prisons, and I feel like everybody does haunted. Of course, the other thing is that we get more listens when we do stuff that, when we do the stories everyone already fucking knows anyway. <laughs> I just hope we're going to have new exciting details. We're not. Everybody doing these podcasts Googles all their stuff from the same source. Google. That's why we Google it. Haunted there. North Dakota. It's a lot harder than you might think. I tried that. I tried that on the road trip one. Cape up dry. So schools. I like schools? Schools. I like haunted schools. School. I mean, I worked in a haunted school, technically. 
Well, you told that story. We're going to not do that. I mean, I'm not going to do that story, but (laughs) haunted schools have a special place in my heart. A place that throws lime wedges and wine corks and beer caps at me. (laughs) Turns the TVs on after I leave. All right. So, sounds like a deal. Next episode, haunted schools. Nick's going to do a- Classes in session. Nick's going to do a haunted Catholic school, because the perp. Ghosts just kept flipping their skirts up. I don't know. And we're cut off. (laughs) <laughs> it will be our last episode. <laughs> we'll be on hiatus while the FBI investigate us. And, Oof. You know, I did have the thought the other day, and I'm not saying that this happens because it usually turns up that whenever somebody gets busted for child pornography, that yeah, they are a complete fucking scumbag. But it would be pretty easy for a hacker to get into somebody's computer and put a folder full of child porn on their computer if they wanted to set someone well, up. I mean, I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that's happened very often because, like I say, most of these investigations, that guy's a scumbag. But, but this is a conspiracy theory I have heard for UFO investigators. That they target them with child porn to... Once they get too much information, suddenly the FBI is coming after them for things like child porn that they didn't know about. Huh. There's definitely a Mysterious Universe episode about that. It was like seven years ago, but... I mean, that seems like a real easy way to take a piece off the board if they're giving you trouble. So that's all yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, no, for real. And then we can send them to Pedophile Island. <laughs> that sounds like the worst mid-season Fox show ever. <laughs> well, I was just thinking it could be like Battle Royale. Oh, okay. Like, they don't have to kill each well, other. What, is the, what does the winner get is the question. <laughs> Nothing. You just get to live longer on the sad island where people come after you with an assortment of weapons like a gun or a frying pan. (sighs) It's been too long since I watched Battle Royale. Got the book around here somewhere. Or at least I did. I remember. You did have it. I know. And I was upset because it's like the only book in existence where there's a car chase scene in the book, but in the movie they left it out. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Granted, I'm pretty sure they made the movie on a pretty low budget. Yeah. All right. So, All right. that being said, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us in real life. Do it. We're, we're not suspicious. We don't care. Life is beating us down. <laughs> I mean, I will punch you in the face, but... All those socials will be in our show notes, as well as the various ways that you can find us online. Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube. You can find our website there. You can find a link to our Patreon. Nobody's bought feet pics yet. You could be the first. We've got swag. We got swag. We got t-shirts. I got a couple ideas I got to put Which together. I realized, like, I ordered... A lemon peel ghost sticker from Tee Public. The day it came out, and I still have not got it. I should probably look into that. Yeah, I thought you got your sticker. I did not get my sticker. I got my shirt. Huh. Mm. No, I'll tell you about Sounds that. a bitch's bumpuses. That's not okay. That's not okay. It's not good for you. It's not good for me. I really have to be. I spit in the face of those who don't want to be cool. All right. That being said, drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost, or anyone else's ghost for that matter, I guess. I guess you can be someone's ghost. Go walking with a ghost. I guess I think. Your ghost ride the whip. There we are. All right. We will see you next two weeks. Bi-weekly. <laughs> I know I always, I always say week, but... Eventually. Who we'll cares? see you eventually. Who cares? We give up. <laughs> All right, bye. Getting lower and lower effort with each one. <laughs>